Hello and welcome to the new season of the Coaching Manual podcast hosted by me, Danny Mills. Today I'm joined by former Manchester United, Middlesbrough and West Bromwich Albion midfielder Jonathan Greening. Jono made over 250 league appearances in a career that spanned 21 years. He was also part of the famous Manchester United squad that won the treble in 99, including the Champions League. Jono is now Head of Player Development at the i 2 i International Soccer Academy in York, a programme that allows players to train and study at a very high level while doing a degree. So welcome Jono, uh, really appreciate you coming on our podcast. So let's go back to the beginning. What got you into football? What got you started playing football? Well, I absolutely love football from a young age. Always had a ball at my feet, uh, always practising. Um, obviously, got one of five um, kids, three brothers, one sister. Every one of us loved football. So from the start, my dad absolutely loved it. So from like two or three, always with a ball. And then did you go into grassroots? Yeah, yeah. So I played for a team in Scarborough. Uh, Schools Park Raiders were called, unbeaten for about 10 years. Top and, and, and it's great now, just looking at you now, you, you've, you've, you're reminiscing, I don't know, what, what we're now, 30 years ago, maybe. But you've just got a smile on your face. Uh, yeah. and, and I think that's what people forget when people have you know, gone into professional football uh, and become very, very successful. When you look back on those days, just the pure enjoyment of just having fun, playing football at that age. 100% right. I think um, I speak to coaches nowadays, say people, uh, kids play too much, and I'm like, Play too much. I played every single day, you know, before school, dinner time, after school, game uh, on a Monday night, uh, two games on a Saturday, two games on a Sunday, five side of my dad, you know, on a Friday night. Played all the time. And I think nowadays, p- coaches I hear say, you know, they're going to get burnt out, they're going to get burnt out. I'm thinking, no way. I just wanted to play. Uh, so, w- so when did you first move into, I suppose, the professional system? You know, who first recognised that you had more than a little bit of a of ability well um it was i was 14 um didn't go through an academy or anything like that so you were quite late really late. In, in terms of getting into the the system yeah really late um i got spotted actually playing for north yorkshire um football and uh, you know the rep side yeah um got into the under 15s team we played again against south yorkshire i think i scored three Obviously, you know, I used to be a striker when yeah. I first started. Um, I, I, I was never that good to even start <laughs> as being a striker. Um, yeah, so I um, uh, scored three and um, my, somebody pulled my dad on the way out in the car park. Just a quiet little word. Um, you probably know what it is. A guy called Ricky Sprazier, who was actually doing Man United um, 23s at the moment. Um, and said to my dad, would your lad like to come for a trial next week um, in York City? Um, and my dad said, yeah. But the funny thing about it is, the next week when I was supposed to go on trial for my trial game, got stuck on the bloody A64 coming from Scarborough to York in a massive crash. So I actually missed my trial game. Oh, no, so obviously mean, no, I mean, no mobile phones in them days, couldn't phone to say you didn't turn up, you, you weren't turning up, there'd been a crash or whatever. So Ricky Spears, you just thought I didn't turn up. So on the Monday night, uh, the landline goes and it's Ricky Spears, yeah, why, why didn't you turn up yesterday? And my dad's like apologising. You know, I'm thinking, oh, this is over with. I'm crying. I'm upset. You know what I mean? So, so, so effect, technology could have ended your career or lack of technology. Lack because, of technology, yeah. Because yeah. it, it could have been a case of they'd have thought he's not interested, he's not bothered, or for whatever reason. And I suppose it could have easily gone the other way and they'd have just ignored you completely. You, I suppose you were quite lucky that they actually phoned you up. Where were you? Really? They, 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 not bigging you up, but they must have actually thought that you were a decent player because a lot of players, they'd have, just, they'd have just binned. Yeah, I was really lucky. I remember being so upset that weekend and then obviously Ricky phoned on the Monday night. But you can imagine, if he, as you say, if he didn't phone, you know, my, it might not, my career might not have got started. Anyway, I went the next week and did, it, did okay in the trial game and then um, they signed me on schoolboy forms and that's how my career started, really. So is he the biggest influence, you would say, or, or were there other coaches that had a huge influence in, in your so in your development, in your young career? Um, I think, yeah, he's one of, one of them. Um, obviously, a couple of years later, uh, when I was 16 and I just signed first, first year YTS, um, he went to Sunderland, he got poached by Sunderland. He tried to take, with, to take, take me with him, but um, uh, Sunderland wouldn't pay the 50 grand that uh, York City wanted. Um, Hang so on, I, can, I, can, I just, can I just let everyone know, listen, this is 50 grand for you, not 50 grand a week. This is how, oh, far, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, yeah, this yeah. Is how far we're going back. I think way. I'd have been on £38 uh, YTS money or something like that. I can't remember what it was actually. But um, yeah, so the two... There, there there'll be kids listening now that are thinking, 
50 grand is that all for you know Premier League player Champions League winner whatever no this is 50 grand for you yeah just for me to go from York to Sunderland yeah not 50 grand a week um, but yeah so I ended up staying but my coaches at York City had quite a few a guy called Brian Neves um, Derek Bell Paul, St- Paul Stancliffe um, they probably you know um, saw a lot in me because I was um, a late developer I probably wasn't you know strong enough or fast enough or you know I didn't have the endurance I probably had the skill but you know um I lacked um, physicality. So then obviously you did well there. So how did the, the move about going to Manchester United, how, how did that come about? Well, actually I was uh, on an old uh, York City, um, you know, staff players night out on Saturday night and I saw the, the manager were giving me my chance in the first team at uh, York, Alan Little. Um, and it's a good story, actually. I remember cracking into the first team about 18, 19, um, scoring loads of goals in the reserves, um, put me in the first team and we played Fulham at, ho- Fulham at home. And he put me up front with a guy called Gary Bull. I don't know if you remember him. Quite a prolific goal scorer in the, in the lower leagues. Um, he was about 33 at the time. I was about 18. And um, I played terribly. I mean, <laughs> I was shocking. Um, you know, even when you look, I look back now, I cringe. You know, that's how bad it was. And I remember going after the game past the manager's uh, office. And all I heard was, Jono, can I have a word? And he was a scary guy, you know, a bit like Alex Ferguson had that aura about him, a uh, horrible headmaster kind of thing, you know, he didn't want to get told off by him. And I thought, oh no, I'm in trouble here. So he called me in, sat down, and he says, uh, how would you like to go to Manchester United, son? And I was like... "What To, to watch a game? <laughs> I was like, uh, what do you mean? He went, Alex Ferguson's been on the phone, he wants you to go training next week, Monday to Friday, do you fancy it? And I was still thinking he was going to crack a joke. And he went... I went, are you being serious? He went, yes. Do you think I'm joking? And I says, oh, I thought you were bringing me in to bollock me because I played terribly. <laughs> and he started laughing. And, uh, and anyway, um, I decided, obviously, I'm not going to turn it down. I spotted Manchester United as a young kid. Uh, ended up going to Manchester United on the Monday. And I trained Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And I always remember after my um, four days of training, with the, I trained with the first team, not the reserves or the A team, it was with the first team. Uh, Alex Ferguson called me in his office and said, Listen, son, um, out of all the young kids who have ever come on trial here, you, you're one of the best we've ever seen. He says, you, you, it's not phased you one little bit. And then a couple of weeks later, I went there. I mean, that, and that must, confidence-wise, you know, a huge accolade from one of what we now know as possibly the, the greatest ever manager uh, in, in, in England, um, in the UK, possibly the world, of what he achieved. Massive confidence boost for you, huge bonus. But what about the players that you were playing with? So you'd, you'd have been just behind... The class of of ninety two. Were you a year, a couple of years younger? Uh, no, so I was yeah four about four four, four and a half five years young, uh, younger. Oh, I, see. I know I look old now. I, th- I thought you were. I, 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 I thought you were. My, I thought you were my age. So you're a little bit younger than <laughs> yeah. me. But I mean, so that must again. So you're but you're training with these guys now. You know, day in day out. This is almost more than a dream come true. I, I'm, I'm guessing at that age. Massive dream come true. Um, um, supported United as a kid. Loved Eric Cantona. It, Unfortunately, just retired a couple of seasons before that. Um, but to be playing with the likes of, you know, Scholes, Bex, Kino, you know, Sh- Peter Schmeichel, players like that, um, was just amazing. And at first, you know, probably first, you know, you struggle, you know, you think I'm not quick enough, I'm not fast enough, you know, um, I need to get better at this. But you've just got to challenge yourself to, you know, but you must have, You must have learnt so much from the players, from the manager, anything in particular that stands out that there were moments almost moments where you just went light bulb moments oh that's it that's what I need to do this is what I, I need to listen to standards um, you know um, well you'll know this because you played um, you know at uh, the top level and played for England but standards was the biggest thing I wasn't know. good enough to play for United and, uh, <laughs> you probably were maybe wrong time <laughs> you were the wrong time um, but yeah um, I think standards was the biggest thing I, I learned um, Roy Keane was you know his standards were so high, but he set the bar for everybody else, really. And if anybody dropped below them standards, he would be on you. So, for example, you know, timekeeping, you know, professionalism, um, wearing the right kit, you know, respectful to staff in 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 Because I, I think rounds. people sometimes forget th- those little things actually make a difference, you know. And, and when you see it now, players walking in with headphones on or looking a little bit sloppy, it's very, very easy for young players to fall into that trap and they are oh, I'll, I'll just do what I like but the moment you have a bad game that gets thrown at you your hair's too long your beard's too scruffy your, your shirt's undone all these little bits and pieces and clearly for you 
that's one of the, the standout things about Sir Alex that, that made him such a great guy. That those standards, maybe like Pep Guardiola is now, were so exact. Yeah, um, 100%. I think um, Alex Ferguson drove those standards. Roy Keane drove those standards. And if training wasn't on point, it wasn't the actual manager or probably um, coaching staff who actually said anything. It was the actual players. You know, so if, if for example, a possession game was getting sloppy and people were giving it the way, it was the actual players who were actually having a go at each other. And sometimes, you know, what it's like, sometimes it gets heated. And um, I think that's what was so uh, amazing about that, that squad at the time. And those standards obviously drove you to the most successful team and be part of that of all time. The, the treble win inside, League Cup, Champions League. I mean, just how good was it to be part of that? You know, you, you were a treble winner. Yeah, I mean, it was amazing. But um, I still think, you know... Um, I feel like a fraud every now and again, you know what I mean? People say, oh, you don't deserve to have the Champions League medal. And I get that because I didn't make an appearance that year. But what people don't understand is, and, and you know what it's like, um, you know, I trained every single day hard. Um, I travelled to every single game that year in the league, FA Cup, Carling Cup, um, Champions League. Usually, yes, I was the 19th man left in the stands, you know, but I was always learning. Um, but every time we come back from the Champions League at two in the morning, the next day I go and play in the reserves. And, you know, I was obviously a striker, like I mentioned before, before I got turned into a winger or centre mid. Um, and I'd scored a couple of goals. You know, I think I got 28 goals in the reserves in 22 games that season. Um, so behind the scenes, you know, I was working extra hard. I was trying to get better. I, I mean, I, I get that totally. I did that with England uh, an awful lot. You know, only 19 caps, but I was probably in 50, 60 squads. Often sat behind Gary Neville in the stands, knowing full well, unless he got injured, I wasn't going to play. And, and I think people forget that sometimes. There's an awful lot of work that goes into the rest of the squad. And I think now we do see these big squads, but the, the effort and the work that you put in is almost more than what the first team players are putting in because you're doing all the work they're doing. Okay, you may not play the 90 minutes, but you've still got to then get up the next morning, train, go to the reserve games, and, and do almost extra work to, to what they're doing. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. And I think, um, you know, um, but it's part of being a young young player in the game as well. You're still learning your trade. Um, I think playing, you know, I was at United three years, but, you know, I, I only made 34 appearances in all competitions, but I probably played 100 reserve games and another 50 behind closed games, you know. So I got a lot of development from that. Um, I left at 22 because I, I needed to start playing regularly. Um, and I didn't w just want to be a player that, you know, stays at a team and be a, a squad player. You, you, you went to Middlesbrough, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, with Steve McLaren. And it's often said that Steve McLaren is one of the best coaches um, around. Obviously, I, I work with him at, uh, as yourself, at Middlesbrough and, and with England. I thought he was a fantastic coach. But can you put it into your... What, what do you think made him a great coach, if you think he was a good coach? Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think um, Steve was a, a, a brilliant coach. When he was at Man United, I think um, when Alex Ferguson brought him in, obviously Brian Kidd, who was a legend of the... Uh, United at the time had, had gone, so it was a big, you know, void to fill. Um, but he came in, his enthusiasm, as you know, his sessions are always spot on. He's always enthusiastic. The sessions flow really nicely. Um, and he expects hard work and um, high standards. And um, yeah, I totally agree with you. I think he's a top, top coach. And when um, he asked Alex Ferguson if he could take me to Middlesbrough with him, um, you know, uh, it got a little bit tricky because Alex Ferguson wanted me to stay. Um, Steve had obviously accepted the... Um, the job at Middlesbrough and he wanted to take me and I think that summer I think United had just signed Van Nistelrooy for a lot of money and um, Veron for a lot of money so when I had to knock on Alex Ferguson's door to ask to leave was not not a pleasant uh, experience I'm, I'm sure it wasn't <clears throat> but you obviously you did very very well for Middlesbrough player of the year 0203 if, if I'm right yeah correct yeah so again you know you're going there so you must be 22 22 23 at the time I mean that's that's a fabulous start, you know, yeah. to your career. Coming from Manchester United, getting Player of the Year. Is there anything in particular that Steve had done at that time, or the coaches had done to to improve you even more than when you were at Manchester United? Yeah, I think um, the first year I actually struggled. To be fair, Millsy, um, you know, I'd gone from playing seven or eight games in the first team a year to playing thirty-eight games in one year, Premier League games. Um, it was a tough first season. Quite a few fans were on my back. To be fair. But I think the best thing about Steve McLaren was he stuck with me. He knew that I was a good player and that I was learning and, you know, getting my first season of playing. And, and had that out. helped that you'd worked with him at United? Because uh, he, he'd, he'd seen you day in, day out and he, and he knew you could probably handle, 
if you can handle the pressure of being in even United's training squad, you can handle pretty much anything else. I think you're totally right. I think he knew I could handle it. You know, he knew I could take the stick from the fans. You know, if I was getting booed on the pitch or whatever. And then I remember that after my first. I don't think year, you ever got booed as much as I did. <laughs> I'm not sure about <laughs> that. Uh, but uh, after my first year, I remember him coming back pre-season and said, "This year is going to be your year." And that year, I played I think nearly every minute of every game, um, and got uh, three player of the years that year, and um, really enjoyed it. My third year when you came. Um, it was quite a successful season, won the Carling Cup. Obviously, I got injured in the semi-final, Tom Afai. Tried to get back fit for the final, but um, Steve bombed me out for Stewie Downing, who went on to have a good career, so fair play to him. Oh, uh, we, I mean, we did. We, we had a, I look, it was an incredible squad of players. We, we, we lacked a, centre, a real centre forward. Um, we had about seven false number nines um, yes. at the time. We didn't really have anyone <laughs> to score too many goals. You were a sort of midfielder, winger yeah. at the time. But of course, we had Gareth Southgate, uh, who was one of the reasons that I went there uh, on loan for that season. I knew Gareth very, very well. Uh, I mean, in your ways, what was he like as, as a captain? You probably you played with him longer than I did. Yeah, I played with him for a full three years. The summer I went to Middlesbrough, he came as well. Um, and he was, what I can say about Gate is he, he is an absolute gentleman, you know, on the pitch, off the pitch. But his professionalism, probably similar to, you know, Roy Keane, that he's, he drives high standards, you know, um, um, not quite as angry. Maybe not as, as angry, <laughs> but he probably does it in a more polite, you know, uh, nicer way because that's the kind of guy he is. But he demands, you know, um, you know, hundred percent in training, hundred percent in games, and he was a born winner, really. You know, um, you know, it was really good for me as a young kid because you know he'd give me advice on what I need to do better, what I needed to work on, and stuff like that. And um, I think you know he's he's done tremendous, obviously with England squad. And did you always think that he would go into coaching? That that would be his pathway. Yeah, it was definitely that kind of player you know you know straight away sort of like you know who's the ones who's probably going to go into coaching or managing um obviously he had the chance at Middlesbrough when he was coming towards of his end the end of his playing career but um you know it didn't quite work out and I think you know what he did well is he took himself out of the game a little bit you know went around watching um seen a few interviews he's done you know other people take training he did the obviously England 21s for quite a few years and he's you know he's built himself back up to um you know England manager and you know He's, he's, he's really highly thought of. What, what I was I always look back on, um, and that's I, I was Gareth's chauffeur for a while. I used to drive him in pretty much every day. Um, but again, you talk about the standards you had at Manchester United. He'd obviously been at, at Palace, at Villa, um, at big clubs, been captain. His standards were the same. And I, and I say to people now, he never messed about in training. I might have done from time to time. Not when it was time to work, but outside of that, you have a bit of a laugh and a joke and kicking balls here, there and everywhere and whatever. You know, we'd have a game of two-touch and you'd beat me pretty much every day. Um, <laughs> I don't think I ever beat you a whole season. <laughs> but even in those little boxes, those little rondos and whatever, every single pass that he made was proper. There was never any flicking the ball around or trying to nutmeg people. He, every single day... He'd, he'd have a massage every single day. He'd make sure he'd drink and eat the right foods and prepare. And it, I suppose that's now what he's trying to instill into these younger players at England, trying to go back to those old school standards. Yeah, and I think um, old, old school standards, you know, is is a must. I think, as you say, like, um, you know, Rondo boxes. I, I mean, obviously, I'm a coach now, and it really annoys me when people start flicking because I'm like. Like you did. <laughs> no, I, I never went in the middle, ever went in the middle. You know that, Millsy. Yeah. But like, I think you you get obviously a different head on when you're a coach anyway. But rondo boxes, small possession games, they're they're, the name, for, they're for a reason, aren't they? Yeah, the, the name of the game is not to go in the middle. Yeah, not to give the ball away. That's the whole point. And I think I um, think you did used to stitch me up a few times. Yeah, I might stitch you up <laughs> a few times just to get you in box. You might be annoying me, but <laughs> um, but yeah, high standards. I think and, and old school values um, are massive in the game still. And of course, you, you moved on to to West Brom. Worked under Gary Megson, Tony Mowbray, another player of the year. I mean, you've done, done not bad, have you, in terms of player of the year and, and that sort of thing. I mean, and that's difficult. Different clubs, different styles, different appreciations. You miss my young player of the year at Man United, Millsy. You're not doing your own work properly, I, well, mate. Well, <laughs> we, don't, we, don't we don't count young oh, player of the right, year. Okay, that doesn't count. Off. That doesn't count. <laughs> but I, I suppose of, of all the managers, is, is there one that stands out in terms of coaching that was different or, or better than, than all the rest? Obviously, Steve McLaren, fantastic coach. We've talked about him quickly. Um, I think one that affected me, you know, you have certain coaches and managers who, you know, who um, probably see something in you you might not see in yourself was probably Tony Mowbray, I'd say, at West Brom. Um, he came in after Brian Robson 
and, and Gary Megson had left. And um, after one game, he said to me, um, going back to, to standards, I suppose, he said, listen, um, I've heard a lot about you, but I just wanted to say, you know, um, I've watched you in training over the last week, 10 days, your professionalism, you, you know, wanting to do extra, this, that and the other. I want to make you captain. And I said straight away, I said, I'm not sure about that gaffer. I said, it's because, you know me, I wasn't really that vocal on the pitch or anything like that. You know, um, you know, I'd obviously have a chat with, with players, but I wasn't, you know, a screamer, a baller or, you know, a tough tackler or anything like that. Um, and he just said to me, listen, I want you as captain. He said, I want people to see, you know, how hard you work in training. You get, you're the one of the first here, the one of the last to leave. You're always getting massages. And um, he named me captain. So I remember going home and telling mum and dad, and my dad was like, are you sure, John? <laughs> I was like, cheers, dad. <laughs> but do you think that was the the transition of the old school captain, vocal, shouting, throwing teacups, you know, ruling by, you know, iron fist, to suddenly actually ruling by, leading by example. You know, th this is how we do it. These are the standards. These are the sort of, this is moving towards a more, a more technical base captain rather than a, than a scream and a shouter yeah maybe but at the time i i didn't really know that i i, I my captains i'd always had you know could talk could lead from the front you know keno southgate i think even you were vice captain once right yeah i can't remember <laughs> but um yeah i think you know it just caught me by surprise and um i think but he really believed in me he changed me from left wing or right wing to sitting center midfield player uh, and he said he wanted me to dictate the pace of the game, you know, slow things down, speed things up, switches a play, through balls, and be the main be the main man really in the team. And um, I think for that them few years, I had Tony Mowbray. Um, we obviously got to the playoff final against Derby, um, lost one nil, even though we absolutely battered him in the final. Um, the following year, um, we went up as champions. I think we scored quite a few goals. Kev Phillips got thirty or something like that. And we lost in the semi-final of the FA Cup to um, Portsmouth, um, even though we should have won that game as well. So it was, you know, two two successful seasons. And then the third season under Tony, obviously we got relegated from the Premier League, even though we actually played great stuff. We probably just didn't have a goal score because Kev Phillips had gone. That was our probably main downfall. And was that, again, was that your mandate at the time? We are going to play good football no matter what and, and not going to sacrifice too many of those principles. Yeah, I think um, it was. Tony Mowbray loved to play out from the back, uh, loved to play through the thirds, uh, wanted the two centre, well, however he played, if he played with one centre midfielder holding. And, and this, was, this was innovative back then, wasn't it? Yeah, you definitely. Know, yeah. No, no one else was really doing that. It was always like, actually, we need to win. Let's get the ball forward, shell it long, boot it as far as possible, get it in the box. Yeah, yeah, true. And I think um, I remember some of the early games um, that Tony had and you know, would win a few games. You know what it's like when you win a few games, the fans are always on your side. But if you draw a couple at home or whatever, you know, the, the fans start getting a bit shaky. And I remember playing a game at home and um, I can't remember who it was against and it was nil-nil at half time, but we had absolutely battered them. You know, we'd passed them off the um, pitch, um, probably, um, I don't know, just 75% possession, whatever, but we should have scored a few goals. Anyway, it was nil-nil. I remember getting booed off. And I remember Tony, who's, um, who you probably know anyway, uh, nice and calmly walked in and said, lads, don't worry about the fans be win. Keep playing the same way. They can't run. They can't chase the ball like that for another twenty minutes. They will go in 10, 15 minutes, and we ended up winning the game three, four nil. And after the game, he just walked in and said, "I told you." Simple as that. You're listening to the Coaching Manual podcast, hosted by me, Danny Mills. After West Brom, you moved on to Fulham, worked with another England manager. So you've gone. So you've got Gareth. You've worked with not as a manager technically. Roy, Steve McLaren. I mean, was Roy different to the others? Roy was very different. Um, I really liked Roy. Um, he was great at me. Obviously, he took me... I, I think Roy gets a hard time sometimes because his demeanour that, that he comes across in press conferences and to the media is quite dour. It's quite dull, quite boring. I always say to people, I don't understand it. If you're in a room with Roy, you know, and, and just or you're having a chat with him, he's engaging... He's funny. He's got all the... The moment the camera comes on, it goes. And I just wish he would come out and be a little bit more expressive like yeah, that sometimes. Yeah, I think it's a defence mechanism, well, mechanism it must, yeah. for him. But um, you're totally right. He's actually, you know, he's a really nice guy. He's got great stories. Um, he's quite a funny guy. You know, um, he's very, very intelligent. He speaks a lot of languages. Um, and when you talk to him, you are engaged in what he's actually saying. Um, 
uh, unfortunately, I had a year with him. It was uh, the year we um, got to the Europa League um, final with Fulham, uh, 2009-10. Um, and all I can say about Roy is he is so well organised. Every single player that year knew the roles and responsibilities. You know, it doesn't matter. It didn't matter if it was me playing centre midfield, Danny Murphy, Dixon Atuu. We all knew what we had to do. Or if I had to play on the left, or if Clint Dempsey had to play on the left, every every single position, everybody knew the roles and responsibility individually and within the team. And you know, he likes to get two backs, uh, banks of four. Uh, the, one of the strikers sitting on their deep line midfielder. Um, maybe not a possession ga based game, but I tell you what, we we knew our, our roles well. And you were so close to winning Europa League Cup final. Yeah, at lost that stage. To you, you, that, Madrid. That, that meant you'd have had Champions League and Europa League. It would have been nice if we'd have <laughs> won it, but um, it'd have been a bit better because at least I played a few games yeah. in that uh, Europa League. Um, but it was a, it was a great season. Um, the manager was top notch with me. Um, training was not an in as intense as probably a Steve McLaren's training sessions. It was more shape, you know. Um, and um, strategy work really, but uh, other than that, you know, it was really good season. Great team spirit, great set of lads, and the biggest thing about them, professionalism to the top. So obviously, football come to an end. Uh, but if you just sort of go back and remind people for, the way I look at it, you were an incredibly gifted technical player, uh, a lot of ability, keep the ball, almost ahead of your generation. Did in. I look at it now, you'd have fitted in perfectly to the way that teams play now. You know, sometimes maybe the games that I played in and, and played play against you at times was a bit more physical, to say the least. Um, first thing I've done is kick you off the park. Uh, that was just how it was. But the, the huge big thing now is everything one talks about ball retention. You know, you're now a, a coach, you know, coaching uh, kids at a, a very, very good level. How has it changed? in your opinion? And, and how has the game evolved from what it was even sort of 10 years ago? Well, you definitely would have kicked me straight away <laughs> from playing against you. But yeah, it's definitely changed. I think, you know, you probably can't tackle as hard as what, you know, you could you could tackle um, back in the day. You know, we're not that old, but we call it back in the day, don't we? But um, I think ball retention, um, I think it has to start at younger age. You know, you look at the, the, the Spanish, Italian kids, you know, they're playing small-sided games, they're giving them challenges in small-sided games, you know, a two-touch, three-touch, three-touch, one-touch finish, um, 10 passes before you can score a goal. And they're getting that from a really, really early age um, in Spain and Italy and, and places like that, whereas not so much in England. I mean, I've got two boys, well, all three of my kids, my eldest girl, she played grassroots as well. Um, and I've got two boys who are 14 and 10 who have played from under sevens. And, you know, there's... I mean, the coach, it's hard for the coaches because, you know, they have full-time jobs, you know, they haven't got time to prepare and stuff like that. And sometimes it's just the parents who are taking it. Um, but I think it needs to start earlier in kids' kids' development about, you know, how to keep the ball first And, and is it still, especially in, in England, is it still too competitive? Are we, are we still too results-orientated at that young age where actually it's about let people express themselves, let them make mistakes, let them learn? I'm a I'm a big believer that you know there's this debate about you know whether to take the score lines out and stuff like that. Not for me. You've got to keep the score lines. But I think you've just got to encourage more um, the kids to you know get on the ball, believe in themselves, um, concentrate on the first touch, wait a pass, uh, pass selection. You know, switch to play through balls, um, defenders, not just kicking it out. You know, um, it, you know. So, so how, how? I mean, so I, I watch a lot of grassroots as well. My three boys are, have been through the system. Parents shouting from the sidelines, coach saying, "Don't do that again." When you make a mistake, how do you deal with players when they make a mistake? So you, you've asked them to play out from the back. Goalkeeper rolls on the ball, and he makes a mistake. How, how do you deal with that as, as a coach now? Um, well, I, I do under twenty one, so it's probably a little bit different because results matter. So um, you know, as a coach, you know, I like to play out from the back. Obviously, you know, I like to, uh, to, uh, to pass the ball. Um, uh, I like creativity, especially in the final third. Um, so I never want to stop my forward-thinking players not to take players on, not to do little one-twos or little sids or little uh, creative stuff to get you know yourself a goal or an assist, whatever it is. Um, but it's game management for me, especially at my level. So 
if I want my boys to play out, obviously they've got to have a first touch, good first touch. They've got to be comfortable on the ball. They've got to have composure on the ball. And the biggest thing is they've got to want the ball. You know, you know, we've all played with players who, you know, hide, hide. don't actually want to get on the ball, but they've got to want to get on the ball, make angles, you know, create space, make the pitch big as they can. But it's playing at the right times. At my le at my level, maybe not um, grassroots and um, under sevens, eights, nines, but under twenty ones level, it's when you keep the ball, you know. So if you're one 0 up with two minutes to go, so his decision making is probably one of the biggest, biggest things. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so once you've got the technical elements, you know, coming through the ages, you're you're coaching now, not necessarily development, but actually coaching decision making, when to make what decision. Decision making, yeah, correct. And for instance, if they make a mistake, it's obviously telling them, you know, they've made a mistake, even though they probably know themselves anyway, um, and then encouraging them to you know make a better decision next time so for example if it's last two minutes of a game and you're two nil up and you sent your center uh center back splitting to get on the ball and he passes it straight to the striker and scores hopefully next time next time it's two minutes you know from the end he's going to squeeze up and the keeper's going to kick it you know and they're going to squeeze in so it's just decision making how hard is it because everybody now wants to play like guardiola we, we saw how good guardiola's barcelona team was back in the day possibly the best football inside that we've ever seen Manchester City are, are trying to emulate that trying to knock on the door of the noisy neighbours across the road the red half of Manchester trying to emulate you know and, and their success you didn't you know United didn't play like that back in the day but the game was different I mean, how difficult now is it to try and get that transition do you think of the clubs that aren't quite as good as Manchester City because everybody wants to be like Man City but is it possible if you don't have the players with that skill set? And, and is it worth persevering? I, I, I just think, obviously, your days at West Brom, where you tried it and got relegated. Is, is, is that acceptable in this day and age because you're playing good football? It's all about players. Uh, you know it. Um, Man City have got unbelievable players. Barcelona have unbelievable players. Very technical. Um, obviously, Pep's got a way of playing. Can everybody do the same thing? Um, yes, to an extent. But... It's all about the players, the top-notch players. Um, obviously, Liverpool um, have got a high press, but good with the ball as well. People have different you know, ways of wanting to play. I don't think anyone can play Pep Guardiola's way without working on it day in, day out. But at the end of the day, if you don't have the players, you cannot, cannot play that way. It's like if I tried to play with my team the way Pep tries to play, I won't be able to do it because the players' first touch will let them down. The weight of pass will let them down. You know, they won't be composed on the ball like somebody like, you know, where David Silva is. Um, and it just doesn't work. So it's all about the players for me. Um, I mean, that's just my own opinion. Um, football's all about opinions, isn't it? And everyone's got a different opinion. But to be like Man City or Barcelona, you have to have the players in, in place in first. What would be your advice to, to coaches that have sort of these ideas that we want to play like this? You know, this is how we're going to play. You know, what would you say to those? If you had a, if you had a room of coaches, what would you say to those coaches to encourage them to maybe coach in a slightly different way at times? I think I'd encourage them to obviously look at your players you've got. Um, if you want to play, playing out from the back or a more of a possession game is identify who's your strongest and weakest players in your team and where you can actually play. So, for example, if you've got two centre-halves so probably weak on the ball, then really you don't want them splitting and getting on the ball. So you might have to think about getting your, your full-backs wider um, and get what, you know, if your two midfielders are quite good on the ball, maybe getting them on the ball earlier and bypassing the, the two centre-halves uh, and playing to your strengths and then playing from there and just telling your centre-halves, I know it's old school, but play simply. You know, you, all you've got to do is head, tackle. As soon as you get the I ball, give it to I, your I, centre I, midfield I play, player. I played or, with... Spencer Pryor, Marta O'Neill was manager at Norwich at the time, and he was like, "Do not let Spenner have the ball." He was, he was in our team. He's like, "Let him edit, let him kick it, and let him do whatever, but do not give him the ball on the floor because he's going give it, to give it to the opposition." To be fair, I had the same when I first went to West Brom. Guy Megson was there, and um, I remember we played played at home, and uh, it was nil nil, and I was playing in midfield, and the ball was you know knocking around. We're keeping the ball, and I passed it to Moro, and Moro was just like booted out a player for like a throwing stroke caught, you know, right in the corner and they nearly scored for me and I remember coming into half time and Mego going Jono, Jono one thing you've got to know is we do not pass the ball tomorrow 
all he has to do is head it and kick it. And I'm <laughs> thinking, right, I better not pass to him anymore. And it's incredible now that he's now gone on to be incredibly successful, you know, at West Brom as, as coach and, and now manager full term. And he's actually playing out from the back. So players do change. You know, they, they, they do change the person. And just because you've not, and I get this as a pundit uh, an awful lot, just because you weren't that type of player doesn't mean you can't coach or describe things in a different way, does it? Yeah, 100%. And I think... Um, I, uh, I knew what I was supposed to do. I just couldn't do it. That was the problem. <laughs> You're putting yourself down, Mills. You, no, were, no. you were a top player, mate. Yeah. You know it. Um, but yeah, again, back tomorrow, you know, he's you know he's gone into the coaching game, uh, managing game, and he's doing really well. Um, probably one thing that, you know, people have said to me this year is that he's actually probably trying to play out too much. So, um, you know, I mean, fans are always going to, you know, more when results are, you know, going the right way. You know, Mauro has not won a game for a few games, and so um, fans are always going to moan. But yeah, you know, he was probably a no-nonsense no centre-half, head, kick it. But he, he likes his teams to play out from the back. A few more questions, just just briefly now. Just walking on to sort of coaching and coaches. One or two crucial bits of advice that you can give to coaches now that you've learned through all your experience with working with some of the best managers the best coaches and now coaching yourself you know and still young uh, in in all honesty those two golden nuggets of advice for up and coming coaches i think the biggest advice i, w I would give to any up and coming coaches or you know grassroots coaches or even coaching the game is one simplicity of the session um, I think just you know when I've done my UEFA B UEFA A uh, my mod FA mod 1, 2, 3 advanced youth award and a lot of it is just you know out there and you're thinking I've been a professional for 20 years and I've never seen anything like this you know you've got diagrams all over the place you know um, lines all over the place numbers going all over the place and it's like this isn't the real you know world you know what well, what so ha have have your session plan. Yeah. Keep it simple. Do it for ten minutes. Yeah. Do your next one and, and just and just do and that's enough, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So basically, I I, I make my se sessions real uh, simple. Simplicity is key for me. So you know, I might start with a warm up, uh, rondo boxes. Might go into a bit of a passing technique drill, uh, into a possession drill. Then I'll take that possession drill, whatever I'm work whatever I'm working on, into a small sided game or half pitch game. Um, but it always has got a you know a meaning to it. But it flows nice and quick. Everything's simple. It's to the point. You know, it's not stops. I hate coaches who stop start. You're probably the same as a player. I think that day and age is gone. I think you can just, you know, uh, shout things, you know, or actually walk into the session and speak into somebody individually, just tell them a little point or speak, you know, in between sessions just quickly or after. I think what I've seen just over the last four or five years of actually doing coaching, um, badges and stuff like that is a lot of coaches stop and start like literally walk into the session every one minute two minutes and you know what it's like as a player Millsy if you're doing a um, possession for six minutes you don't want to be stopped eight times in that possession drill you just want to go and play don't you and get a sweat on and work on things so I think that's the biggest thing simplicity and maybe not as much stop stop starting that's brilliant just going to finish with a few quick fire questions um, if that's all right Best kit you've ever played in? You've played in a few. Yeah, I've played in a few. Um, I think it's got to be, you probably might back me up, I don't know. It's got to be wearing the England kit, doesn't it? You know, I mean, I only played 18s and 21s. Um, so I uh, got in one full squad, actually. I don't know if you remember, but I Do you know what? When I, when I looked at that <laughs> question, I didn't actually think of England kit. In honesty, yeah. I, 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 no, I just I don't I don't know why I just went to all the club teams. <laughs> all right, no, when I was thinking about it last night when you sent me the questions over, um, I was thinking of quite a few. I liked my old York City kit uh, when I first made uh, pro, you know, because it always has a special place in your heart when you play your first professional game. Um, but I think it's got to be just wearing the England kit, you know. Um, you know, you as a young kid, you always dream of playing for your country, and you know, you you've experienced the the World Cup, so you're one step ahead of me, mate. <laughs> well, you've got a Champions League though. F funniest thing you've seen on the training pitch? Uh, the funniest thing I've seen is probably um, back when I first signed for United. Um, we we're training out at the cliff, the, the old training ground, and uh, me, Wes Brown, a few of us were just pinging a few balls, as you do, like you mentioned earlier in the program. And uh, 
Alex Ferguson was talking to Kiddo in the middle of the park and Wes has just pinged one to me and it's just gone off point and it's hit uh, Alex Ferguson right in the side of the head. Ooh. And everybody, it was just like one of those moments where everyone just, you know, is in shock. And you know, even like Roy Keane was like, oh, wow. And Ferguson just turned around and went, who the hell just kicked that ball? And Wes was like that. And then to be fair to him, he was going mental for about two minutes. And then everybody in the whole pitch just burst out laughing. Oh. And even Alex Ferguson burst out laughing. So I'll probably say that. I, th- I thought you were going to say Steve McLaren's teeth. Oh, yeah, time. yeah. When, it, when it he came that. out of, I, I remember that day. <laughs> I when forgot came, about that. <laughs> Steve McLaren had his teeth done, didn't he? Yeah. I, th- I think he had one too many put in. There was like too many teeth in his mouth. And, and they, they were, were like, so white. They were Hollywoods. Yeah, yeah. One, of the, one of the first I ever. I forgot about that. That was funny, yeah. Worst dressed teammate? Well, apart from you, Millsy. Thank you. No, to be fair, you're, you're not too bad. We've had a few. Um, Boring dressed, I'd have taken, but yeah. not worst. <laughs> you're always safe, mate. Always safe. Um... Probably, there's a few. Carnu, terrible dresser. Remember Jeremy? Yes. Terrible dresser. Remember when he used to come in them like robe things? Uh, Joseph Desire job. He was terrible. Ter- he was terrible. Yeah, and then probably I don't know if you were there with Dean Windass. Dean Windass was no, but I, I've I've seen Dean yeah, a few times. Yeah. Yeah, not the best. Uh, I'm just trying to think anyone at West Brom who was quite bad. Um, no, it was quite safe there, actually. Carney was probably the worst at West Brom. Um, and Fulham was decent, to be fair. Quite direct, you know, London well, Club. Down, down, posh, down, posh down, London down, down the quite... Kings Road, down the Fulham yeah. Road, all in the designer gear. Yeah. Not so I'd probably there. say, you know, Carney while Jeremy, they were terrible dressers. Most underrated teammate that you played with? That's a tough question, that. Underrated. Um, I'll tell you who is probably underrated and gets a lot of stick. But um, I think he doesn't deserve. He's probably Chris Brunt. Um, you know, I played with him for three or four years. He was actually a YT at Middlesbrough when I first went there, and he got released, and he went to Sheffield Wednesday and built his career from there. But you know, he has got a wand of a left foot, uh, maybe lacking a bit of pace, but his left foot, I don't think I've I've seen much better than his left foot. Um, I think he's very underrated. I think West Brom fans. Um, probably a bit too hasty with him you know harsh on him uh, especially the services given he's been there yeah. nearly 10 years and uh, on his day he can whip a great ball he can score free kicks he can set goals up um, so he's probably one of the, the underrated players I've played with Worst game plan and what manager prepared it? Worst game plan yeah. I remember playing um, Barnsley away with West Brom I think we were third in the league, fourth in the league, about January, February time. Um, it was the year we got lost in the playoff final. And uh, we were doing really well, playing 4 2 3 1, whatever you want to call it, false 4 4 2, all, all the same in it, formations. Um, and we decided to go three at the back. Hadn't played it all season, hadn't really worked on it. And uh, we were 4 0 down at half time. Not, not a good to one. Be fair to, to be fair to the manager, he came in at half time and said, Listen, hands up, my fault, let's go back to it. And second half, we did all, all right, but we still lost the game. This might be difficult. A lot of players. Best trainer? Best trainer. One, one name, that's it. That is a big one. Because there's some good trainers around. Even you were quite a decent trainer. Southgate, you've got to put Southgate up there as well. He was an unbelievable trainer. Um, I probably have to go Roy Keane. Probably have to go right. Like, standards. Standards. You know, if it was a passing drill, he used to go mad if, you know, your first touch let you down or if it was bobbling into you. If it was a possession drill, if you lost a ball, he would be on you. His standards were so high and I think it has to be Roy Keane. Worst trainer. There's a few of these at Middlesbrough. I was only Worst there for a year. Trainer. Oh, there's quite a few, yeah. Um, uh, Massimo Macaroni was a bad trainer. Um wasn't a great striker either. No, maybe not. <laughs> I said that, not you, don't Joseph, worry. Joseph, uh, desired job was probably a bit, went in that bracket of... Flaky. Just, yeah, flaky, say. just trying flicks all the time and not doing the right things in training. Um, West Brom, probably, um, we had a guy called Boston Caesar. I don't know if you remember him, left centre half. Um, in games, actually decent, but in training you'd think, don't ever put him in the team. But actually, when he played, he was actually quite solid. Um, 
Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Not many bad trainers, to be fair. Best player you ever played against? Tough question. I'm going to say it's either Xavi playing for England 21s against Spain or Paul Scholes. Because They're not bad, are they? Paul Scholes, as you know, had asthma, could hardly run. Pre-season was always at the back, never did gym work. But you could not get near him on a football pitch. He was so clever. You went to go tight, he'd flick it around the corner. If you didn't get near him, he'd be spraying it all over the park. You know, he could score a goal. Um, and Xavi was just unbelievable as well. Very similar to Paul Scholes, dictated the pace of the game. Proudest moment in football? Everyone probably think it's the Champions League, uh, like we talked about earlier, but it's actually winning the championship with West Brom. Um, so obviously the year before, that, the, the start of that season, I got named captain. Um, and then that season, you know, I played every minute of every game, all 46 games. and Which is some achievement, by the way. Just to play every single minute of every single game and not get injured is, is some achievement in itself. And then to win it. Yeah, well, I actually played 55 games that year. Every minute of 55 games because we got to the seventh final FA Cup no, as well. No, you're just showing off now. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. but um, yeah, I think that's the proudest moment because obviously I was named captain. I wasn't too sure. I wasn't too comfortable being named captain. Um, changed position a little bit to a bit more of a disciplined centre midfield player. Uh, and had a lot more responsibility um, and obviously you know what it's like the championship's a, a tough league um, it's not easy as everyone finds out it gets relegated so to win on the last game last game of the season against QPR away and to lift that trophy was some feeling If you go back and play for just one coach throughout your whole career who would it be? It has to be Alex Ferguson doesn't it? Um, you know it would have been nice to play for Alex Ferguson when I was a bit mature as a player, you know, between 25 and 30, um, and maybe after 200, 250 games of experience. Um, so I'd probably say Alex Ferguson, yeah. And just one last one. Have you ever used your name to get to the front of the queue or restaurant or anything like that? 100% mate, I do it every Saturday night. <laughs> 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 Fair play to you. Right, thanks, Johnny. You've been an absolute star. Really appreciate you coming on the Coaching Manual podcast uh, and good luck with all your coaching. Thanks, Millsy. Thanks very much to Jonathan for joining us for the first in the new season of the Coaching Manual podcast. Thanks to everyone for listening. You can keep up to date with the Coaching Manual on social media. Follow us on Twitter at Coaching Manual or on Instagram and Facebook at The Coaching Manual. Go on the website www.thecoachingmanual.com Register for an account now for session planning tools, high quality coaching content and more essential resources. Thanks for listening and see you next time.